Father, we won't leave here tonight the same as we entered, but we will leave here changed as a result of your Spirit speaking to us through your Word and through your Word proclaimed. So, Lord, we commit this time to you. May all that we say and do during this hour bring you honor and glory. May be a sweet aroma that's lifted to the throne room of heaven tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For those of you who are here, if you're a guest of ours, let me just say welcome. For those of you online, welcome. We're glad that you are joining with us for this time of worship. Uh, just in case you were looking for a place to worship this weekend, tomorrow at 3 p.m. out on the front lawn, we will have a cross draping service where we will read through the scripture, the seven last words of Christ from the cross, and have that draping service. And then on Sunday morning at 645, we'll have a sunrise service in our fellowship hall. And then at 830 and 1045, we'll have our worship services here as we celebrate the risen Savior on Sunday. And so I hope that if you don't have plans to worship someplace yet, that you would come and be a part of Mill Creek as we celebrate together. You're in for a special treat tonight from a variety of perspectives, from some children singing and our choir, as well as our guest, Carl Mardian, uh, this evening. I'm not going to introduce Carl because I want him to tell you who he is and some of, uh, some of what brought him to the place where he is at this time. And so I hope that you're ready for a wonderful evening as we gather together to worship, to remember as Christ gathered with his disciples on that night, which he would go to the garden in prayer and then also be betrayed and arrested. Our kids choir is going to sing for you um, the old rugged cross. And as you can see, I'm down about 20. So we've got them out of town, we've got them sick, we've just got all kinds of things going on tonight. So we're going to sing the first verse of the old rugged cross. And then I'm going to invite, we're going to invite y'all to lead you in singing the um, third verse of that when it's time.
so grateful uh, that we have his salvation and and only through his son uh, Jesus. So who I am, <laughs> um, I grew up in Roanoke. As I mentioned, my mom helped you know, kind of manage the pool. I used to spend the summers there with my uh, girlfriend, now my wife, uh, and uh, we got engaged after that. And, um, and so we have a lot of connections to this area. And, um, but I grew up in a home where um, my mom loved God. She would pray all the time. Uh, she, you know, would pray for parking spaces. And, uh, you know, and literally, uh, you think I'm kidding, like at Hills at K-Spring Corners as a kid, we'd pull in and she's like, okay, Lord, give me a parking space up front. And, and uh, you know, <laughs> somehow she always had them. So my mom... I love my mom, and uh, she she would uh, she would teach me so much about how much God loves loved me, and and uh, and so forth. But I never really knew the Bible. I never knew the scriptures themselves. And so, this is my bugaboo now, since I've come to trust the Lord. 
that we really have a, a, a society that's um, biblically illiterate. And, um, and we have a calling if we, if we are to um, be faithful stewards to actually pick up the book and study it. And um, so uh, because it's life, <laughs> uh, and in those words are our directions for life. Uh, but it, what happened to me is 20 years ago, uh, 22 years ago, I, I had an encounter with the Lord that caused me to suddenly say, I've been living a lie of pretending that I'm a good guy when I really wasn't. And that, that uh, made me confront the fact that uh, I didn't know God, I only knew about him. And so uh, it caused me to start a journey of trying to figure out who he was. And what I just kept hearing as I was doing this journey was, you don't know me, you don't know my word. You don't know me, you don't know my word. And so the Bible became like, okay, how do I learn the word? Well, find a church. So I found a church that taught the word. And, and I was going there, and they brought a missionary in um, who was from Israel. And I was telling him, oh, my dad's Jewish, and I didn't grow up with him or anything. But, and he's like, well, then you're Jewish. And then I find out my mom's dad, or uh, dad was probably Jewish as well. But that was many years later. But I was like, well, what do I do with this? I don't know what this means. But, but many years later, um, about five years later, I had this meeting with Dave Ramsey. Some of you probably know who he is online. I was down there training uh, with them to do some counseling. And in the midst of that, I discovered that uh, his lead counselor was married to a Jewish woman, and he gave me a book. And that book kind of was a catalyst to me kind of figuring out what does this mean to be Jewish. And then it moved me to the next level as I really wanted to serve the Lord. And so a man came into my life by the name of Sam Nadler, who uh, was a missionary to Jewish people. He uh, grew up Orthodox, and he shared with me how to establish a healthy congregation that I had to start in my home <laughs> and uh, with my wife and my children, and then we can talk about a healthy congregation. And I was like, well, that's a lot of work. Can't I just move to Charlotte? And he said, you're going to have the same problem there. We're going to tell you it's about your home. Um, and so it began this whole journey. So 10 years ago, my wife and I, we, we planted a congregation in Roanoke um, called Hope of Israel Congregation, uh, specifically to, to help my people, the Jewish people, come to know the Lord. Now, we'll take anyone that the Lord sends through the doors, right? But our target is to teach the Jewish people that the Messiah who came is their Messiah. And for me, looking backwards at Passover was one of the most critical turning points of me understanding how that works for Jewish people. We have a lot of traditions in Judaism, which are beautiful, but they're really traditions. And some of them have been going on so long, nobody remembers where they began. And you guys probably have some of those here, too. <laughs> You're like, why do we always put the meatloaf in the pan that's too small? The whole pot roast joke with that, right? Um, and so my goal tonight as I go through this little, little handout, you should have that, um, is to talk about a couple of these. I, I could teach on Passover for four months every week for two hours and not touch everything. So we're going to skim through, but there's going to be three things that I really want us to talk about. The first are these four cups that you see before you. That's why you'll see little sections, four cups. The second is four questions. Um, in the Passover meal, um, a child, usually the youngest, is encouraged to get dad at the table to tell a story. And I don't know about you, but my uncle would always, you didn't have to prompt him, he would always tell a story. You know? And so he was kind of like my dad growing up. And so, um, and so there, these four questions are to prompt dad to tell the story of the Exodus. So the Passover meal is focused on remembering the Exodus from Egypt, how God redeemed saved and pulled out the Jewish people from, from Egypt, but he, helped, he told them to leave some things behind. And he gave them things that they had already been preparing beforehand and didn't know what they were doing. And we'll talk about some of those. So the third thing is this thing here uh, I want to talk about. It's one of the most important parts of our meal. It's called the matzotash. It means bread bag in Hebrew. Um, and so, uh, actually, you know what? It's still sunlight out. So, Hag Sameach Pesach, uh, in Hebrew means happy Passover. Um, so, it's, uh, today is actually Passover, the first uh, day of Passover. So, um, so what I want to do is I want us to understand, if you look at your scriptures, uh, if you have copies of the Bible with you, it's important, uh, the 
That way you'll know if I'm making something up. Um, you know. Um, Exodus chapter 10, verse 2. It's talking about the Passover. It's talking about children. There's four verses that are, this mentions this in different ways. But in 10, 2, it says, And so you may tell your son and your grandchildren what I have done. This is God speaking to Moses. In Egypt, as well as my signs that I did among them, so you may know that I am, I am Adonai. Adonai is Hebrew for the Lord. Now, did you catch the who is getting the benefit of it? You. Our testimonies of what God has done in our lives to our children and our grandchildren are meant to remind us. Remind us. Kids, God is good. He is so good. Yes, we're going through a terrible time, but God is good. He's so good. This is why we have to tell the Passover story. This is what the Lord tells the people of Israel. You're to do this meal thing. He doesn't give a lot of instructions on the meal. We had to make that stuff up as we went along. Okay, there were just three things that were included in it. But what's weird and kind of cool is that some of the traditions that we put in before Jesus pointed to him. And we still do them in the synagogues and in our homes. And a lot of people are like, oh, we do it for this reason or that reason. But those that know the Lord and know their scriptures, they're like, no, this is why you do that. You just don't see it yet. And I'm going to show you a couple of those. The second verse is from Exodus 12, 26 and 27. It says, now when it happens that your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean? You are to say it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover because he passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he struck down the Egyptians but spared our houses. So the people bowed their heads and worshipped him. Again, the children are the focus of the Passover reminder. The next generation has to know about how good God is because if they don't know, they're going to go the way of the world, the way of the Egyptians, the way of the pagans. They're going to go the way of everything the world has to offer. And, and it's our responsibility as parents and grandparents to share the testimony of God's faithfulness in our lives. And the Passover story does that. So we use these things like these Passover plates. There's all kinds of these. This is our fancy metal one that we use. A few years ago, my wife got a really nice glass one for me for Father's Day because it's the father's job to lead the Passover meal. It's mom's job to light the candles and start the meal and keep everyone in order. <laughs> There's a Hebrew word we use called shah. Ladies, you can say it now, shah. Sh sh that means be quiet. <laughs> so I mean, dinner, you can say shah, and nobody will know what you're saying. Um, I remember when I learned that word in Spanish, I felt so empowered. Um, so then the third verse that I want us to understand is Exodus chapter 13 and 14. Again, it says, so when your son asks you, and in times to come, what is this? Say to him, by a strong hand, the Lord brought us out from Egypt, the house of bondage. And so each part of our meal, as you look here, this, um, this cup, each section of the meal is divided up by cups. And it's really, this is really, really important because when you get to understanding um, the Lord's Supper and what he did, you start seeing the relevance of these cups that were done. They didn't have four cups. They probably had one cup and they passed it around or what have you. Um, but in the first cup sec section there, what does it say there in the gray? The first cup is called the what? Cup of sanctification. Well, this is what they've called it for thousands of years since the Exodus. And, and the reason is it comes from Exodus chapter 6, verse 6 and 7. Where it says, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. But before we even can get to that cup, you'll see there at the top this preparation for Passover. The homes have to be prepared um, and our hearts. Well, who are the Bible scholars in the room? What is leaven generally representative of in the Bible? What? Evil or sin? Usually, leaven is representative, of, usually, not always. There's one case where leaven's representative of faithfulness of God. But in 99% of the time, leaven represents sin because it puffs up. Pride puffs up. 
And so when we prepare our homes, now Judaisms will do all kinds of stuff. There's all kinds of Judaisms where they'll, they'll literally wrap their entire house in aluminum foil inside to make sure there's no leaven exposed. Or they'll sell their business so that they're not having to clean out all the leaven. Just crazy kinds of things. But the, it really comes down to kind of a spiritual matter. A friend of ours made this little broom and dustpan for me. And uh, we take our kids and m my wife would hide little breadcrumbs around the house. Usually those little goldfish or the um, oyster crackers, you know. Um, and, and then I have to come home from work and pretend like I don't know where they are. And I go around and sweep them up. And, and we talk to them about this is like hidden sin. You know, those things that we don't tell anybody we've got. But we know where they are. But the Lord tells us we have to prepare our hearts and our homes to get ready for the Passover lamb. So we, we go around and we, we clean it up and we take it outside of the house and we burn it up. And, and that's what we're supposed to do with sin in our lives. We're supposed to, it, the Holy Spirit is convicting us of sin and we're supposed to say, yeah, that's sin. We're so, to confess it, but then we're to do, there's a Hebrew word for this next step, which usually gets skipped. And it's really important. This Hebrew word is teshuvah, and it literally means to turn around. That's what repentance means. And so we clean our homes with, we get the leaven out before we can enter into this telling of the story of the bread and, and the wine and, and so forth. But we take this first cup and we drink it, and we do this special blessing, and then we start pulling out food items. And, and so the first one is like a parsley, and we dip it into salt water. And, and the parsley is to remind us about how wonderful life is, how fresh life is, right? Everything's going great. And then you have some medical illness, or something happens, and you have this bitterness that because salt that comes in, you start crying over this whole thing. So it's, it's like this representation of what it was like in Egypt when we're in bondage. That our, yeah, we have life, but then the tears just soak over our lives. And then we dip the, the parsley twice. This is where the questions come in. One of the questions that's asked during the Passover meal is the, the children say, dad, dad or granddad, why do we dip twice on this night? So one is to remember the tears that we had in bondage. The second one, and this has been done for thousands of years, is to remind us of how joyful life is. And when we've been redeemed, the tears we have of joy. Like, I, I look back on the times when I was redeemed. Like my wife texted me right before I got here. She goes, she, she knows that um, my mom would have been so proud. She died three years ago, went to the Lord. That she would have been so, she's so proud of the, the, what the Lord has been doing in my life. That it's this testimony of what she poured into me all those years. Um, and it brought tears to my eyes. Because it's joy but it's also sadness that she's not here, right? So it's that sense that, that yeah, we're in, we've been set free and we're so excited and so overjoyed at what God is doing. So that's where the Passover um, uh, parsley kind of comes in. I told you one of the big things that, that we do during the Passover meal bring, brings in this matzah tosh. And it's at this point in the meal after the first cup where this comes in, and it's really important. So inside of this is a secret compartment. <laughs> um, and so I've got two of them. Uh, one I keep crumbed up uh, with all the matzah inside of it. But each pocket has a piece of matzah in it. And we have done this forever. Nobody knows why. Um, we pull out the middle piece of the matzah. There's three. We pull out the middle one. And the head of the household takes the matzah. And he holds it up for everyone in the family to see it, you know, shows them the holes in it and stripes, and then he breaks it, okay? And then he takes half, and this is where it gets so, so strange. He takes half, and he wraps it in a white cloth, and dad goes and hides it somewhere. This piece is called the afikomen, it's the hidden one. And the hidden piece is taken away and hidden until the third cup. When he gets it, when the kids go and find, and they get a redemption surprise, usually money or something. But this hidden white cloth gets tucked away somewhere, and the kids get excited to go find it during dinner. And then he takes the uh, other half, and he breaks it, and he passes it around uh, to everyone at the table to partake in, um, in this blessing 
that's done here. And the, the blessing is uh, called the chamotzi. It's the same one that, that Jesus would have said. Uh, and just a, a causal note here. I just want to make sure. I, if I say Yeshua, do you know what that means? Yeshua is the Hebrew name. It's kind of a shortened version of Jesus. It's really his, what his mom and dad would have said. Hey, clean up your room, Yeshua. You know? um, and so if I slip, we use Yeshua in our congregation all the time. Um, so I sometimes, I forget to tell people that and they're like, what did he just say? Um, yeah, so, um, okay. So this is really important. Does anybody catching this, the middle one being taken out? Are you seeing like Judaism has been doing this forever. There's three crosses. The one in the middle is taken out, broken. Part of it's taken outside the city. It's just the symbolism is so shocking and that it's hidden away to be found later and the one who finds it is given a prize, like the prize of finding the Messiah. Like when he calls you and you find him, it's this overjoyed feeling inside of, wow, this is what I've been missing. This is true fulfillment. So when we get to the second cup, um, this is where these four questions get asked. Um, and the four questions simply lead the, the hearer into... Um, you know, Dad, why do we eat herb, bitter herbs? Well, we eat the bitter herbs because it reminds us of, of, our, of the bitterness of slavery. You know, those that have been redeemed can look back in their life and say, I remember when life was like this and how hard it was because I had no hope. But once we come to faith and redemption and we're reminded that we have to keep focused on the hope that is within us um, and telling others that we can get caught up in the bitterness of life. I flew back from the West Coast uh, yesterday or Tuesday night late, and our flight got delayed by like four hours, and I'm just trying to get, make sure I could get a rental car. And, and I see these people coming up and just screaming at the gate agents. I mean, just, uh, I was in first class. And I, and I was like, holy smokes, how, how do you behave this way? And I'm like, oh, wait, I've done that. And I'm like, I've been bitter. And then I have to, and then I had to talk to the gate agents and tell them, don't, don't worry about that. What can I pray for you about? And they're like that. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact is, is, you know what? We all have times where we go through bitterness. We have to have brothers and sisters in a community that'll call us back to the Lord and say, no, no, we have a, we have a, a God that's greater than every bit of bitterness that you can imagine. And that's our focus. And so when we go through this, we're reminded of the bitterness of slavery in Egypt, but we're drawn back to God's faithfulness as he took the children of Israel out of Egypt with a strong hand. Now, uh, how many plagues did he send on to Egypt? Ten, right? Yeah. Um, so ten plagues. Now, what's interesting, and some of you probably already know this, but those ten plagues were the gods of Egypt. And so when he uses those plagues to attack the Pharaoh and the, children, and the people of Egypt, he's actually using their own gods to attack them, including the 10th plague, which was the most devastating of all, which is the killing of the firstborn. But it says in Exodus, the Lord God tells Moses and he tells Pharaoh, if you won't, re you won't release my firstborn, the children of Israel, I will kill your firstborn. He gives him the warning over and over and over. And the scriptures remind us not to harden our hearts like Pharaoh. And then later, not to harden our hearts like the children of Israel did at the, at the waters of Meribah. Because they hardened their hearts and, and rebelled. Or like the sons of Korah who rebelled against the Lord. And so there's this whole idea, this juxtaposition of rebellion versus faithfulness and trusting what God's doing. Now remember, they were in slavery for four hundred years fulfilling the scriptures that were told to Abraham Abraham was told your children after you will be so there'll be a multitude they will be taken captive for 400 years but after that and so this promise of this coming to fruition was just beautiful and so the children of Israel see this being played out but when we look at this second cup, it talks about these, four, these plagues in our tradition in our home, and, and many people do this. They take their grape juice after they've blessed the second one. Um, that's why we use fours, because you're going to stick your finger in this. And so we put a white napkin down on the table, and we stick our pinky in, and we throw it onto the napkin for each of the plagues. And we yell them out, frogs, 
flies, pestilence, right? And then we stop before we read the, the tenth, the killing of the firstborn, and we hold up the napkin, and it looks like blood. Because God redeems the children of Israel because they put blood on the doorpost of their home and, and got into the home. It wasn't the blood that did it. It wasn't the lamb that did it. It was trusting to go into the door. And it didn't matter if they were Jewish or not. There were lots of non-Jewish people, Egyptians, that went into homes with Jews. They trusted the Lord. That's why he says to them, anyone that wants to join you, they need to be circumcised, the head of the household. And they can join you. In other words, bring them into the Jewish faith. And so it's a shocking thing that God wants to save anyone that will trust. Just get inside the door with the blood over it, not outside. So if every lamb in Egypt had been slain, but nobody put it on their door and went into the home, no one would have been saved. It was the simple faith of putting the blood on that doorway and going in. It's so shocking when I start thinking about this. It's the same thing with, with Jesus. If we just simply would apply the blood of that sacrifice that happened 2,000 years ago to our, the door of our hearts and trust that enough, that simple faith, we would be saved. But it's so hard for so many of us to do that. I remember uh, when I worked at Montgomery Wards in college and people would come through after their Sunday school class, you know, on how to save a person at the stores and they would, you know, come in, if that was you, thank you. But at the time, I, <laughs> at the time I thought you were a pain in the, you know, because I, you know, people would come by and said, are you saved? I'm like, from what? Well, I go to church. You know, I just kind of blow them off. They're like, you're working, it's Sunday. And I'm like, so? You know, I go when I can. You know, I had all the excuses in the world. But that night when the Lord interfered my life and I, and I, couldn't, I couldn't do anything else but listen to him, it was those Bible verses that I heard going into my head. All those verses that somebody said to me at some point or another that would ring into my mind. And, and, it was, and it was that that said, I need to know the word of God. And so I draw that back to this whole idea that the children of Israel needed to come out of Egypt. And he tells them to not eat leaven and to leave in haste. And those that make bread in the, in the group here, you know you have to take one lump and hold on to it for your next batch. So you have the yeast or the leaven for the next loaf. If you don't, it takes a long time to wait to get that to happen. But he told them to leave all the old leaven behind. Get out of Egypt. And he'd provide what you needed as you got there. And he did. It was so beautiful. And so when we look at this, we do the plagues as a reminder. And we get to this, um, this third cup. And, oh, we leave a, um, a shank bone. This is the other thing um, on, the, on the Seder plate. Because it reminds us that the sacrifices are no longer um, being done because the temple has been removed. The temple's gone. Uh, a few months ago, uh, two months ago, we had a man. Um, well, my wife is very good with Instagram. She's figured out how to do the posts and all this stuff. And, and um, this man went, was cert he, he, so we're very protective in our congregation. We're not only believers but we're Jewish, many of us, and so we have a double target, right? Um, so we lock our doors, and we have security, and we have people, you know, that kind of take care of that. And this man comes in, they open the door, let him in, and he's wearing sweatpants, but he's wearing a kippah, uh, which tells us he's Jewish, and uh, he's looking around, and, and I told the security guy, I was like, put him up front, uh, right on the front row, I want to be able to watch him. And so they bring him up front, and they put him over there, and he's looking around, and all the whole service. Afterwards, he comes over to me, and he goes, are you the rabbi? I said, yeah, I'm the rabbi. And he said, uh, I, I'm from New York. I said, so how'd you find us? He goes, I was looking for a synagogue that had a Torah scroll and a rabbi. So a Torah scroll is the written scriptures that have been written by hand. Ours is 90 years old. It's from uh, Poland. We rescued it. Um, but anyway, he, he said, so I just pulled off. Well, come to find out, he's an Orthodox Jew from New York who teaches Talmud, and finding a Messianic synagogue was not what he had planned. <laughs> uh, but he saw something there that he'd never seen in synagogue, and that was the joy of knowing Messiah. 
the singing and the praising of God. And, and, um, but there were expectations that he had for the place that he was going to show up. And some of them were met. Others were blown away. Um, and so I say this because all of us bring things into the mix that, that can confuse what the Bible's saying. And we have to sometimes just let the Bible speak for itself. And so when we get to, um, when, when, the reason I brought that up is the sacrifices. He said to me, well, uh, I said, well, let me ask you a question. We were going back and forth, sword fighting. And I said, well, let me ask you a question. I said, how are you made right? Leviticus 17, 11 says the life is in the blood. And the blood makes atonement. So how are you made right? There's no temple. Oh, well, the rabbis say, Prayer, giving alms, uh, donations and so forth, and fasting will make you right. And we have some verses in the scriptures that seem to kind of affirm those things in a sense. And I said, well, but it says this. And he said, yeah, hmm, I'll have to get back to you. But this is what happens when we've built up in our own ideas, our own minds, what somebody has told us. Versus what the text says. What does the Bible tell me about how I'm made right with the Lord? And what does the Bible say about how do I walk out my faith with Him? And, and, what does the, and so I'm just saying this because we have lots of traditions. And some of them point to the truth of Messiah. And we use them in our community, in our home. Others are just fun. <laughs> you know, like we put in a tradition. They put a, an egg that they roast in fire to remember the sacrifices that are no longer happening. Um, I think they started because they were jealous of Easter eggs. I'm just saying. I just, um, but nonetheless. Um, but it, it's, it's at this point in the meal uh, that, that, um, that they would sit and eat. And this is, if you look there, um, it says, um, well, this is the other point I, mentioned, I wanted to mention to you and, and very important about this third cup. Um, we're not going to get to the fourth cup because the fourth cup is the one that that Jesus says that he, he will not have until he has it in the New Jerusalem. Um, but we call it the cup of Hallel in Judaism. They'll, they'll drink it and they have another cup, which is Elijah's cup, uh, waiting for Elijah the herald to come and proclaim the Messiah. Um, those of us that know the scriptures at all know who, who fulfilled the role of, of Elijah. John the Baptist? Uh, yeah, the Methodists say he wasn't a Baptist, but we know... <laughs> Just say <laughs> the immerser, right? Um, the, the point, <laughs> the, the the point is, is that um, they were they're still expecting. So we leave a chair empty for Elijah to come. They're expecting somebody to herald the Messiah. This is the role of every believer today to herald the Messiah, to declare that he has come. And this is the problem. We have too many weak. Believers who don't know their Bibles well enough or have not trusted enough in their, redeem, in their redemption to actually declare it. We need to declare it. Every one of us, every one of you has to be bold in it. My, my mentor told me, you know, he was a, a Jewish uh, guy. And, and anybody see that movie that was out recently, the Jesus um, Revolution? Or, um, all, all the Messianic Jewish leaders in America today that have more gray hair than me or no hair, they all came to faith in that movement. The Messianic movement around the world was rebirthed during that season. I hope they'll do 12 more with all those leaders. My mentor was one of them, and he said, you know, if it wasn't for bold Christians telling me at the bar I was working at that I needed Jesus, I would never have found him at the bottom of the pit. They were praying for me all the time, he said. When I called them because I, I, I needed to know what to do next, they said, oh, we've been praying for you. We'll come get you. Because somebody was willing to be a herald to proclaim his, the, the faithfulness of God. So when we get to the third cup, this is when Jesus took that uh, afikoman, that hidden one. Uh, you know, maybe they sent a kid out. I don't know if that tradition was happening at that time, but they always hid this one in that white cloth. It was that one that he took out. It's that one that he takes and he, before he breaks it, he sends one of the disciples away. Right? He does not invite them to this covenant, Judas. 
Judas refused the covenant. So here's what's interesting about this whole thing. If you'll open your Bibles, I want to share one piece of scripture with you that many don't realize is there. Some of you are probably much smarter in the Bible than I was um, coming to faith. I didn't realize this was in here, but it's so important. When Jesus says, I'm making a new covenant, it's found in Jeremiah chapter 31. Now, Jeremiah writes this passage to a sinning, awful community in Israel. The north and the south have been divided. They're fighting. They're worshiping fake gods and and sacrificing children on the altar of Baal like our nation's doing today. There's all kinds of stuff that's happening. It's bad. And Jeremiah is saying, listen, it's going to get worse. However, there's going to be a new covenant. And so in verse 31... It may be 30 in your translation. Mine's like Hebrew ordered, so it's a little different. But it starts with, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out from the land of Egypt, for they broke my covenant. Though I was a husband to them, it is a declaration of the Lord. But this covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, it is a declaration. Now, this is really important. I will put my Torah, which means path, on their hearts. He says, within them, I will write it on their heart. I will be their God, and they will be my people. And then it goes on to say that the promises are going to continue for a while until there's no longer a sun and a moon. Do we know when that happens? It says that the Lord will be the light for us and we won't need a sun and a moon at one point later. But for now, we're living in this new covenant. This is what he does when he lifts up that that bread and he says, this is my body broken for you or shed for you or bruised for you is probably a better adaptation. And the cup, this is another really important thing to know about covenants. Almost every covenant in the scriptures it, they use three things. Almost every one, if you look carefully, you'll see it. All through the covenants. Bread, wine, and what? Blood. Bread, wine, and blood for almost every covenant in the scriptures. So we have the wine, we have the bread, and then later that day, remember night begins our day in, in the Hebrew likening of the calendar. Later that day, tomorrow... And the day is when he would be sacrificed and his blood would seal that covenant. Opening the door for every one of us afterwards that would be willing to enter into that covenant. The covenant is forever. And so when he does that, they're remembering what was happening. The temple had been so corrupted after that point, it just was unheard of. But that's what's happening when, when Jesus lifts up that bread and that cup and they all begin to see it. But that's why he dismisses Judas. So uh, my call for all of us when we think about this, so in just a minute, um, pastor's going to come up and, and lead the Lord's Supper for, for all of us together, um, is that when we look at this and we look at the Passover meal, that's what this is to be remembering. It's in, pass- he says, do this in remembrance of me. That pronoun has to be uh, like studied. What is the this? Well, it's not necessarily all the, you know, the traditions of the Passover plate, but it's the covenant that he makes. That's what we're entering into when we do this. This is why we have to have our hearts cleansed. This is why Paul, the the leader, tells all the people in Corinth, listen, make sure you don't approach this unworthily. It's dangerous with humility and and awareness of who who made this covenant for you. It's a beautiful thing. And so I just want to encourage you, just think of every time you guys do this Lord's Supper, just remember, that's what Exodus 10-2 was talking about. So you can tell your sons why God is so faithful in your life. Amen? Amen. This evening as we gather to celebrate and to remember. Carl, thank you for enlightening us 
when it comes to the bread and to the cup. We've known for some time that it's that cup of redemption that we share with one another. This evening, um, our deacons will have two deacons on each side, and uh, one will be holding a plate with bread, and one will be holding a plate with the cup. And we will invite you, as we have been doing, to get up and come down the center aisle, to come across the front to receive those elements, and then to return back to your seat. And so let me invite the deacons who are going to be coming forward, or who are going to help us come forward this time. And church, after three years of a sealed cup and wafer, tonight, we will have a cup, and thank you to Shirley Holdren, who made us some unleavened bread that we will share tonight. We thought this was a special night. It's time to put away the plastic. Lord God, as we prepare to come into your presence to receive this cup and this drink, Father, we thank you for the word that Carl has shared with us this evening, for the meaning that he has brought forth for us, Father, and how we can take what you gave to your people. Father, we can claim it as our own for those of us who claim you as Lord and Savior. So God, as we prepare to receive these elements, Lord, Speak deeply to our hearts and our minds. Father, cause us to confess those sins in our life that are hindering our relationship with you, even at this moment. Father, as we come down the aisle, if your spirit speaks, cause us to confess. As we cross the front and return to our seats, Lord, remind us of those things that are hindering our relationship with you so that we can approach this meal this evening from a new perspective. Bless us during this moment, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're sitting next to someone who may have some mobility issues, would you offer to serve them this evening and to grab to receive these elements for them as well? As the music plays, let me invite you to begin to make your way down the aisle.
that Jesus would be betrayed. He gathered with his disciples in an upper room to share that Passover meal together. This evening, Carl has helped us to better see some of the symbolism as well as some of the things that Jesus did not do that evening. We do know this. He took the bread, he broke it, he gave thanks, and he blessed it. Would you pray with us? Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam hamotzi lachem ben haaretz. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the ground. Christ said, as often as you eat of this bread, eat it in remembrance of me. By fashion, he took the cup, he blessed and gave thanks for it. Would you pray with us? Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. As often as you drink of this cup, Jesus said, drink it in remembrance of me. Father God, we give you thanks. From the beginning of time, Lord, you had already ordained all of these things. Father, we thank you for your great love for us, the love that sent your Son to die on the cross so that we could be redeemed. Father, this evening, as we pause to reflect and to remember on that final night where Christ shared this Passover meal with his disciples, Lord, we give you thanks. It is in the name of our risen and living Savior that we pray. Amen. This evening, we're going to sing a congregational hymn. I want to open up an invitation to you. I appreciate one of the things that Carl said that really struck with me is we need more heralds. We need Christ followers who are committed to his word but also committed to heralding that word to others. So tonight, if you're in this place, you may find yourself in any number of moments where the Spirit is speaking to you. Maybe it's a moment where tonight, all of this has made sense, something has clicked, and tonight you want to give your life to Christ. Tonight is that night of salvation for you. As we sing this song in just a few moments, I would invite you to come and allow me to share with you what it looks like to invite Jesus into your heart, to become a disciple of his, to follow him and to grow in him. Maybe you're sitting here and the Spirit has spoken to your heart and you're realizing, wow, there is so much treasure in this book that I have not found. And maybe tonight, where you are, here at the altar, or if you'd like me to pray with you, you're just wanting to make that commitment, Lord, I want to discover more of those deep treasures that you have for me. Father, tonight, I want to commit myself to growing in your word, not just to read it, but to become a disciple of it. Or maybe it's to be that herald. Maybe you recognize you haven't been that voice, that mouthpiece of the Lord that he's called you, created you to be in, in an act of commitment or rededication tonight. You just want to do that. The altar is open. I would be honored to pray with you. If you have a decision of some type to make tonight, as we stand and sing this song, I would invite you to respond to the prompting of the Holy Spirit in your life. And again, as I say every Sunday, if nothing else, it gives us an opportunity to worship as we sing. So let's stand together. If you have a decision or would like to have prayer, I'll be right here.
let me, let me invite you to take a seat. Depending on which gospel account you read, Scripture says that following that meal, they sang that halil. They went out, Jesus and his disciples, to the garden. It became a somber moment for us. It's one of those moments that really begins for me personally that journey where I realize this is what it took. For me, for me to become a believer. And so we want tonight to leave in a sense of reverence. And so in just a moment, Cindy and, and Patsy and Jean are going to share a song with us. And then I'm just going to ask you to leave in silence, whether you go out the, the doors to the sanctuary back here or out these doors, to leave this place in silence. And once you get out, you can talk all you want. But we want to leave this place a sacred place this evening. And Tony has said, or Carl, I met him as Tony. He started texting as Carl, and I'm like, who are you? <laughs> Carl has said he will, he's willing to, to hang out for a little while. He said to like 1.32 a.m. He's got to be home by 2.30, though. If you would like to talk with him, he's just going to go down to the fellowship hall, and he'll be down there. You can go down and say a word to him. You can go down and thank him down there if you want to do that. But Carl, thank you. Thank you for answering my emails, my calls, my texts, and for your willingness to come and to share with, our, with this group this evening. You have blessed my heart and challenged me, so thank you for that. And so, as I say at this moment, I'm going to offer a prayer. They will sing. We will invite you to leave in silence. So, Lord God, as we continue our journey in the Holy Week, and as we leave this place tonight, understanding that the next place you went was to the garden, where you agonized, where you prayed, Father, if it be possible for this cup to pass from me, but not my will, but yours. God, we know we understand the progression of what takes place from this moment. Help us not to bypass it and to jump straight to the empty tomb. Father, help us to recognize what was necessary for our redemption so that we could claim you as Lord and Savior in our life. Be with us as we leave this place tonight, as we go through the day on Good Friday, and as we regather on Sunday to celebrate. Lord, speak to our hearts, we pray. Amen.
I don't know where he went.